Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Living in the Light. So let us start with a prayer. And I don't need my glasses. My glasses will not help me see the masters any better. So let's just pray with our hearts. Divine Mother, Heavenly Father, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master Paramhansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, humbly we bow to you all. Dearest friend Swami Kriyananda, help us to be in tune with your presence. Help us to know that you are living with us even now in invisible form, but perfectly visible to our hearts, to our spirits. Help us to feel that we are individually loved and guided, and that every desire of the heart will be fulfilled in deepest surrender to Thee. Om. Peace. Amen. Well, friends, we are wonderfully continuing with our new dispensation. So, what we've been talking about is Swami has been trying to put across the point that autobiography of a yogi as a catalyst for the spiritual revolution that has been really going around the Western world and around the globe over the last, well, 100 years since Master came to America, and it would be 70 years since the book came out, 75, Um, that there's also a specific and powerful message from Master himself. And Swami's trying to get us to, to think more carefully about the potential of a a relationship with Master himself and trying to walk the fine line between not appearing to be sectarian, but at the same time, as he puts it, it would be to to pay attention to the blessings at hand. So there's one more paragraph here. Swami says, True, not all seekers are attuned to this particular ray. It is for each one to decide which ray is best for him. But for every individual whose natural attunement is to another ray, there will be many in our times, and in America particularly, for whose benefit this ray was quite literally heaven sent. I was thinking about a letter that Swamiji wrote to someone, and I'm I'm pretty sure... I always look around to see if the book is back there. Not that it makes any difference, but it's just instinctive on my part. There's a book uh, Swami wrote called In Divine Friendship, which, as it happens, I'm doing a Tuesday night series on that book. Today is Tuesday, and I will be talking about it tonight at 7 o'clock. It's a free class. Um, In it, I believe it's included in that book, Someone wrote to Swamiji about, it was not about finding their path because they were already on the path of Master and Ananda, but finding their particular work and place within Ananda. And uh, the woman wrote that she was waiting for something to inspire her, is how she put it. And Swami wrote specifically to that person, but he also it was also a general principle. Um, He said, you speak of waiting for something to inspire you, and then you will give it energy. He said, you must understand that you also have to give energy before you will find inspiration in what you're doing. And it's it's a very important point, and it especially relates here. It's not just that you sit there and wait to feel called. You you also have to put out enough energy to get into the wavelength where that kind of subtlety can speak to you. Just a moment here. Many times people miss something that 
could help them greatly because they're too passive and, I have to use the word quite frankly, too low energy to be able to receive it. So let me, let me give you a, a very specific example of my, my starting. The, <clears throat> the specific ray of grace that brought me to an understanding of self-realization was through Sri Ramakrishna. And that's why often I talk about him, because he was, he was, I learned the word later. For me, I believe he served the role of Upa Guru. An Upa Guru is someone who, who could be a Sat Guru, meaning a Sat Guru is a fully realized master. I mean, Ramakrishna was an avatar. He and Master and our whole line of gurus, they were all of the same uh, realization. So you could have someone who would be a Choto guru, which is a small guru, which is to say someone who, even your music teacher or um, someone who, who teaches you Sanskrit or the scriptures. So they're not your sat guru. It's not the guru that's going to bring you to God, but it's a guru-like relationship. So it's a small guru to you. Um, Upa Guru is someone who, and I'm perhaps I'm those of you who know more exactly, maybe I'm misdefining these words, but the concepts are true. Is is a Satguru, but you, but not your final Satguru, but simply the one who helps you along the way. But the relationship is profound and divine, and it was very liberating to me, very very touching to me when I finally actually understood what, who Ramakrishna had been to me. And I found many others also have been helped by having that concept because sometimes we do give ourselves deeply to another line before we finally come to our, our home. And, and yet that relationship was deeply sincere and utterly essential. So Ramakrishna was my upaguru. And I was introduced through the teachings of Vivekananda to his teachings in, it would have been June of 1966. And I met Swami in November of 1969. So for that period in between, I was very devoted to Ramakrishna. Um, it, I never took any initiation, though, or, or never made anything formal about it. It simply never occurred to me, probably by God's grace. It just never occurred to me that that's what I was supposed to do. But I went to his temple. Um, in, there was a Vedanta temple in San Francisco. There was one in Los Angeles. I went to both of them. I read the writings. I was just, and he, he took care of me. I was very conscious of the fact that Ramakrishna was taking care of me. So it was not a light relationship. It was very deep. And then my friends met Swami Kriyananda, suggested that I go see him. And um, I was at a loss as to what to do with myself, but it, it hadn't, the, the queer, it, it just hadn't, I just didn't know what to do. I was just confused. When I met Swami Kriyananda, as I've, you've heard me say many times, it was an instantaneous recognition, an absolute understanding that I needed to be with him. And, and he provided, he provided a life which is what I was desperately seeking, which is I could move to Ananda village. I could integrate. I, knew, I finally knew what to do with everything I had been learning from Ramakrishna because I, I was completely convinced and totally seeped in it, but I, I couldn't figure out what to do with it. And the way you got information in those days was from books. And I lived here right in this area a few miles from where I'm living now. And I went to East West's bookshop all the time. And I started reading through the books about saints because I wanted to know how to live it. But they were um, in ancient India. They were in Himalayan caves. They were in Tibet. They were in Catholic monasteries. I just, I, what could I do with any of that? So I was still just completely at sea. Um, they were serving leper colonies. <laughs> I actually tried to get a job in a, a care facility for older people because it was the closest thing to a leper colony I could find. And I did get a job, uh, very the lowest level job. I mean, the, the, the hiring agent couldn't believe I, would, I was going to take that job. It's a job done by people who can barely speak English with no education. You know, it's a real entry level job when you have no other choices. And I was, uh, even though I had no degrees, I was obviously a highly educated person 
who could have done so many other things, but I assured them I knew what I was doing. I lasted maybe two days for this reason. One of the things that we did was we gave a lot of tranquilizers to the older people so that they, uh, you know, would be docile. And I was, from the, I was from the drug culture. I mean, I wasn't really a druggie, but I was from that culture. And I knew what those pills were. And I felt I was, I was, I was heart sick because, you know, there it was. I, there was nothing, I, I couldn't do it. I had to resign. There's, it, there's a vagueness around that experience. I can't remember anything more except the extraordinary disappointment. So, because I was going to like be like St. Francis. St. Francis was really also, St. Francis had really come into my life very strongly at that point. So I was trying to be like him. And this, this was taken away from me. I was going to go into uncongenial circumstances and do um, sacrificial menial work. Basically, that was my goal. And I couldn't. So when I met Swami and I could go to Ananda village, it, it really was, it was the last gasp before not knowing what to do, I was rescued. However, and see, Swami never presented himself as a guru at that time. It just wasn't even in anybody's thinking. So Master was the guru. So all of a sudden, I had Master and Ramakrishna in front of me. But I, I, the, I didn't, and I didn't know, and I didn't know what to do with that. I had no idea what to do about Master and Ramakrishna because I knew that there, there, there was a singularity to the discipleship relationship, and I had two. And but I knew I needed to be with Swami, and that was so crystal clear that I just followed that track, and I had some personal karma I had to sort through before I was actually able to land at Ananda Village. But even when I landed, I needed to be with Swami. I was thrilled to be there. And then there was Ramakrishna and Master over here. And I, and this is precisely what I did. This, this was how I saw it. I was unable to sort it out. I couldn't even begin to sort it out. I just like, no, I was being sincere. And there was a contradiction, and it was a mess. But what was I supposed to do about it? And the reason I couldn't sort it out is because I didn't have su sufficient intuition to reconcile a seeming conflict. How was I going to get that intuition? Was I going to get that intuition by sitting and waiting for it to become clear? Going back to this letter Swami wrote, shall I sit here until something inspires me and tells me what to do? But that's not likely to happen because the problem is I don't have the consciousness to be able to perceive it. So I have to do something to change my consciousness so that I'll be able to understand something that I can't understand now. Understanding won't come merely by sitting here and waiting. Energy has to be applied to the issue, but there's no energy I can apply to the issue. So I have to apply energy to changing myself. So I, I, uh, I said to both of them, basically, um, I know that I'm supposed to do this. I'm going to throw myself wholeheartedly into this life. I'm not going to hold back and wait and see, sort of. I'm going to do absolutely everything. I'm going to follow Swamiji, doing everything he suggests as if I were certain. And I sort of said to Ramakrishna and Master, you guys sort this out. And I just put it aside. And it never troubled me even slightly, even when it was time to take Kriya. I mean, these things were a little less clear. Well, they were less clear to me because that was the whole problem, is that I didn't have the consciousness. But it came time that September. I came on June 1st, and in sometime in September, I don't know the date, there was a Kriya initiation. I remember I sort of saying to Swamiji, you know, should I take Kriya? And he, he said, well, of course, like that. And I thought it was, I thought there would be more of a, a question about it, not because of Ramakrishna, because I never brought that up to Swami. It never occurred to me to bring it up. But I just didn't know. He said, of course. So I just took Kriya because Swami said to. And he and because there was no question in Swami's mind but that I ought to, so it was part of my policy. And I, w I was there. I feel like it was about a year and a half or maybe a year after I was well into it. I had taken Kriya. I was practicing. I was living in the community. Everything was there. I literally woke up one morning, and it was just this clear 
uh, and this clear, absolutely unquestioned feeling, of course, Master is your guru. Why would all of this have happened if you weren't? And it was, oh, that's nice. And then I just went on from there. But I'm certain if I had sat on the sideline waiting for something to draw me, of course, Swami had it drawn me, but, but on that question, if I'd waited on the sidelines for it to become clear, it probably never would have become clear. And I never would have committed myself conceivably to anything. And so there's a, there's a real interesting point here, which is, yes, there is this unique relationship that we have with the Master. Yes, there is a unique path that belongs to each one of us, but it comes to us when we commit ourselves. And this is very important in Autobiography of a Yogi. Um, this happens to be a, one of the first editions that somebody gave us a long time ago. Now I'm probably not going to be able to find the page. The characteristic features of Indian culture have long been a search for ultimate verities and the concomitant disciple-guru relationship. The relevant point here is the word disciple comes first. Many people think the word guru comes first. When I have my guru, then I will become a disciple. But until you're ready to be a disciple, you will not have a guru. And so you have to behave like a disciple first, because otherwise there is no receptivity. There's, there was a quality in Swamiji's life that was so interesting, which was he was so powerful. He was so dynamic when he presented the teachings. He was so extraordinarily clear in his ability to dismantle doubts and dismantle arguments and give an answer that was so satisfying. And, you know, with such an ability, often comes with it a certain um, aggressive relationship with people and with people's doubts, um, the attitude of a debater, you might say. And it was so notable to me. Now, there were times when Swamiji would speak very sternly, like there would be satsangs and someone would ask a question, he would answer very emphatically, sometimes in a way that was not supportive to the person who had asked him. Sometimes he would even interrupt a person when they were beginning to ask a question, wouldn't even let them finish their question, which sometimes annoyed people. I gradually began to realize there was a pattern to that. If he saw somebody going in a direction that was either pulling the satsang down or was pulling the person down, he wouldn't necessarily let them finish. Sometimes people would want to say, well, you know, I have this problem and it's such a difficulty because you know what happened when I was a child and then this came up. And so I mean, would just watch them convince themselves that they were weak and incapable. And he often, once he got the gist, he would just stop them. He would interrupt them and then just answer the question. Or they would ask a question in such a way that they were really trying to defeat, uh, that their, their very vibration was had an edge on it. I believe I referred to that yesterday in this satsang when I was talking about the person who brought up the question about Lahiri Mahashaya said just to do Kriya. And even though it was a sincere question, it was also a veiled, barely veiled criticism of the way Swami was guiding Ananda. So oftentimes Swami had a, a very, very acute sense of those things. And because I was so interested in Swami and how he did things, uh, and I knew he was not rude, <laughs> that whenever he behaved in what appeared to be a rude manner, I was always interested as, as to what made that situation different. It would be easy to say that Swami lost his patience, but since I never saw him lose his patience, I had to think maybe there's another explanation. And consistently over time, I observed that there was. So, where were we in this? Oh, yes. But Swami never tried to convert someone, ever, in the sense of if they were insisting on saying no, he would not say, he would not debate them. And he would never use his willpower to defeat their point of view. He would invite, and if you were sincere, he would work endlessly with you. And, and that didn't mean he wouldn't have... Um, serious intellectual, or intellectual is not the right word, but if you came to him with a sincere question and a sincere doubt that, that, was, that you wanted an answer to, 
that it wasn't a matter of wanting to prove that you were right and he was wrong, but that you were really struggling with it. Swami would, would grapple with your doubt as intensely and as long as you needed to, but he would never impose when he could feel that the receptivity wasn't there. Have to speak when he was in a whole satsang, <clears throat> and most of the people in the room were drawing from him in a certain way, and one or two people were trying to, not not meanly, although sometimes were wanting their energy was going to be disruptive to what everyone else wanted. He could be he could be forceful in that situation, but he 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 never intruded on our free will. So. We have to understand, the the point that I'm trying to make here now, what I'm trying to say is, if we aren't calling to God, you know, sincerely and deeply seeking an answer, God is not going to come and unlock the door and, and, you know, force his way into the room. That's why the word disciple comes before the word guru. So when Swami writes here, you know, for all those who are sincerely attuned to another ray, which is perfectly reasonable, there are many, many more for whom this really is their path. And Swami's just trying to wake people up to the fact that, take this seriously. If you've read Autobiography of a Yogi, or come in contact now, we can say it, with Ananda or the people of Ananda, or read one of Swami's books and feel deeply inspired, don't just passively wait and see if more inspiration comes to you. Go questing after that inspiration. Immerse yourself in what you see and, and, and uh, try to awaken within yourself um, uh, a deeper understanding. Because there's another principle at work here, which is, and this is actually was part of my um, understanding back in my very first year, which is there was no doubt in my mind that, of, that Masters was a true path and Ramakrishna was a true path. And therefore, only good could come to me from following a true path. A true path would awaken me and bring me closer to God. And and then from that, anything else I needed to know would come to me. So no harm is, no, no, no effort is ever lost if you're not even sure that it's a true path. That's a whole different question. But if among true paths, this is the one that's in front of me, Drink deeply of it, dive deeply into it, and everything else will follow. If you wait to be sure, nothing much will follow, and it will become a self-perpetuating prediction. Oh, I read Autobiography, and I was inspired by it, but I never felt to follow that path. Well, yeah, but are you following any path? Are you putting out any real energy in any direction, or are you waiting to be inspired? So that's what Swami's trying to say. It's not at all sectarian, and, except to say that Master's teaching is uniquely suited to this time and this place. That's why he says many, many, especially in America, will come to this. So <clears throat> now we're into the next section, which is called Transmitting Stations. Common among religious works in the West is the belief that the individual doesn't really count, that what matters is the work itself. Now, of course, this is 1983, and Swamiji is contrasting... This This is a point of view... <coughs> Forgive me. <coughs> Swamiji is also trying to counter what he feels is a misrepresentation of Master's work that has been presented by the organization Master founded. And so there is a certain amount of corrective here. Common among religious works in the West is the belief that the individual doesn't really count, that what matters is the work itself. Now what Swami means by that, it's, it's important to really understand that, which is if you have a strong church that is well understood, that is well established, that is visible to people, that, that presents the reality of this teaching. We're talking about Master, but let's just talk about Jesus. Here is a Methodist church. Here is a Presbyterian church. Oh, yes, 
I know what a Presbyterian church is. I'm attracted. I, you know, I can go there, and I know what I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn about Jesus in a certain way. You might not know the details of Presbyterians versus Methodists or uh, Methodists versus um, Baptists, but you, you can have some idea. And if it's well established, if it's clearly defined, if you can walk into it and the rituals are communicate and the hymnal communicates and the, the creed communicates and the I believe communicates and everybody there is all on the same page and they'll tell you the same things and they'll support you and they'll show you that you do these certain things and then you have this experience and then this is God's promise to you. You can see obviously. These are very, very helpful things. When a person begins to search, to have a clear, um, well-defined path that I can find and follow is very helpful. And so every individual, every pastor, every member, every deacon in that church contributes. <clears throat> but it's the, <clears throat> it's the established institution itself that it is really um, the 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 goal, and we we must keep the institution clear and strong, unified, and not too diverse, and not too filled with, and then maybe this, and then maybe that, and then maybe this, so that people can find their way. And that's how that's how the Western mind thinks. In the West, the institution is really the definition. Nowadays, all that is fading. But the institutional idea is still, it's, it's part of our way of thinking. Because something is well-established and rich, it looks more real to us than something that's humble. I mean, really think about that. You know, one of the reasons, and with all due respect, that SRF is so well-respected is because their places are so beautiful. And this was especially true when Ananda was really funky. It was very hard you would go to SRF and you would see the Lake Shrine and you would see Mount Washington and um, it was they were just and they are they're so gorgeous and they have they have wonderful vibrations also, but the Western mind can't help but be influenced by the fact that they're so well established and they're so beautifully established. It doesn't mean that they're not good, but it doesn't spiritually speaking inherently mean that they are. But it, the mind is tricked into believing it. And that's a Western point of view. I'm going to give a little example uh, from Swami's life. In It would have been in the late 70s, I think, would have been the time. When we went, uh, Swami was invited to be a speaker at what was called the Meeting of the Ways, which was these periodic conferences that were being put on around the country, but especially on the West Coast at that time. And he was, and all of the major teachers, and this was the heyday of the, the New Age movement really coming across uh, America. And Swami was representing Master, and then there were all these other teachers there. Swami Satchidananda uh, comes to mind. I, the others, I can't remember the other names. He's the main one, but everyone that was in, important, prominent is the word I should use. And there was a reception ahead of time at somebody's beautiful mansion in the beautiful district in San Francisco. We arrived a little late. I think we were driving Swami's um, Chevrolet, which was his $150 car that he got from the Air Force, from the Air Force surplus sale. And it was just this old American car. It was, it ran great because we bought two of them. It wasn't $150, it was a $75 car. The mechanic bought two of them so he could use the parts from one to keep the, the other running. And it was a great car. And we pull up, and there are Mercedes, and there's even a couple of Rolls Royces, and a Cadillac or two. These are all the other teachers who are parked there. <laughs> we parked somewhere and walked in. And after it was over, Swami said, I have to get a new car. He said, in America, where money is so easy to come by, he said, this is how he put it, he said, in India, they would respect me more because I drive this car. And they would be suspicious of people who drive fine cars. He, because in India, absolute renunciation is the definition of a spiritual person. He said, so driving clearly showing that I'm impoverished, he said, is a sign of spirituality in India. In America, he said, 
where money is so easy to come by. And he wasn't criticizing those other teachers. He said, in America, where money is so easy to come by, he said, when you have a, a, a dearth of money that is indicated by the fact that I drive such a crummy car, he said that the Western mind thinks there must be something wrong with what he's doing. Otherwise, he wouldn't be so impoverished. And Swami so, wasn't even criticizing it. He was saying, I just have to get a better car. And he went out and he bought this sort of mid-level Ford, which was which the design of which it was a little hard to tell whether it was an expensive or an inexpensive car. It was a perfect choice. It just looked like a good car. So he could drive it without being ostentatious, but clearly he could afford a good car. And later on, he actually, I was going to say made us, but led us to make Ananda itself more beautiful for exactly the same reason. He said, if it's too impoverished in the West, people won't believe it. But we ourselves as Westerners have to be careful not to think just because it's wealthy, therefore it's spiritual. It might be successful, but is it spiritual? I'm not saying it's not, but it's just a question because in the West, institutions are respected. Now, I'm going to stop because it's the end of time, but obviously we're just starting this part of the discussion. So God bless you, my friends.